Since the 1950s, rockets have been our go-to workhorse for sending people and payloads into orbit. They are some of the most complex machines ever built, the ultimate boost into the sky. But they aren't exactly new. Even modern rockets have historic roots going back in time. Some ancient projectiles were powered by chemical explosives like gunpowder. In 1232, Chinese soldiers repelled a Mongol army using flaming arrows, likely propelled by simple rockets. Today, rockets are far more powerful, able to send humans to the moon and the International Space Station. Solid rocket ignition. But rockets have limitations. Putting things in orbit is hard. It takes a lot of energy. Rockets are hard. They take a lot of energy. Basically, the amount of fuel required for rockets to reach, you know, the outer reach of our atmosphere is the limiting factor. Something like 92, 93% of the mass of any rocket is, is fuel, leaving about 5 or 6% for the actual structure and only 2% for the payload. There is a high demand <laughs> to put things into space, but there are limited means of getting it there. But that may soon change. If engineers at a company called Spin Launch can make the dream imagined in this promotional video a reality. Spin Launch is a highly unique way to get to space. The idea itself goes back to caveman times. It's a sling. A sling is an ancient hunter's weapon. It's an improvement on the arm and shoulder's ability to throw a stone. Archaeologists have found ancient evidence of slings, some at least 12,000 years old. For Jonathan Yaney, the sling is an inspiration. It rotates, and at the end of a rotational element, you have really, really high speed. So Jonathan embraced a radical idea. Use that speed to launch a spacecraft into orbit. A sling is something you spin around, and basically, the more you can spin it, the more force you can basically put on the release of whatever you're slinging out. But if you scale this up, that same principle has the ability to launch a rocket into orbit. That's incredible. That idea has been met with skepticism. So the spin launch team has much to prove. It is one of those ideas that just sounds too crazy. I think it's good to look at things from a place of skepticism uh, at the outset. But then you have to be objective about looking at, well, what are the underlying physics and what might really be possible? The spin launch team is using electricity to generate rotational speed faster than the speed of sound. The proposed payload, a satellite encased in a bullet-shaped shell, must withstand up to 10,000 Gs, or 10,000 times the force of Earth's gravity, until it is released at just the right moment. Once the aero shell gets around 40 miles up, the casing would separate to allow two small rocket engines to propel the payload the rest of the way to low Earth orbit. The arm itself that's actually spinning around needs to be able to withstand it to a certain degree as well. So you have a need to not only make sure that it's structurally sound, but there needs to be precision in the timing and the programming of that actual release point. I don't have any classical training as an engineer. I self-educate. I read a lot of books, <laughs> lots of books. And then I read them again, because I didn't really understand them the first time. I became an engineer along the way. The team's first goal was to build a proof-of-concept mass accelerator at one-eighth scale to validate the key technologies and use it as a test bed to spin potential space-bound components at many times the force of Earth's gravity. Also known as, as G-forces, and uh, G represents one unit of Earth gravity. When a pilot pulls up on the yoke of, of their jet and they make a hard turn, they'll feel the equivalent of multiple times Earth gravity, upwards of eight Gs, for example. 
But spin launch payloads will have to withstand forces orders of magnitude stronger, as many as 10,000 Gs. So the team is working on building and testing components that can survive such extreme acceleration. You know, in some ways, we humans are sort of timid. We feel most comfortable with things that look like things we're used to. So you can't really tell at the outset whether that thing that you're going that's outlandish is really gonna work. Today, the spin launch team is asking a critical question. Can a payload like a CubeSat survive 10,000 Gs? So a CubeSat is this miniaturization of satellites, literally making them into these little cube components. So this 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter unit is one piece that can be added on top of each other like Lego blocks. So we have some of the most critical subsystems that you would see on any satellite. We have a solar cell here. It generates a current that charges this battery up. And then the battery stores that energy, right? And distributes it to all of the critical subsystems that require electricity. So the OBC or the onboard computer is one of them. This is the, the brains of the satellite. The team is confident the CubeSat as a whole will survive. But so far, they've only tested individual components and never the whole system. You know, it's a very, very common strategy in engineering to say, we're gonna break this problem into small parts. We're gonna solve each of the original parts, and then we're gonna put it back together again. The team aims to test some of the components that are typically found on CubeSats, starting with the computer. So this is saying effectively its power rails are all working correctly. It looks to be talking to the world just fine. So far, they know that the battery pack is particularly vulnerable. A pre-test of the battery pack system didn't make it out of the accelerator in one piece. This gave us a great benchmark when it hit 7,650 Gs. It was pretty darn close. And we didn't have to do all that much to make it compatible with our launch environment. The batteries aren't designed for 10,000 Gs natively. The spin launch engineering team had to figure out how to make the batteries more resistant to the high G forces. So this is the original. We saw these batteries laying on top of each other. The concern there is that when you're on the bottom of the stack, you're getting three batteries worth of mass squished onto you plus your own mass. Yep. Right. This orientation of the battery cells didn't work out so well in the spinner. The G-forces are going this way, and you can even see the bolts are embedded and bent into the base here. One of the things that we did was turn it sideways. Yep. Right? Let each battery support itself and yeah. itself only. So we're going to fully populate this satellite with all of the key subsystems that we're testing out here. This is the pre-spin test of the solar cell, 1.2 volts. And then after we're done with the test, we will check it out again and make sure that it's still getting a similar uh, voltage reading. This is gonna be the first time that this unit with everything in it, the battery pack, the computer, is spinning up to 10,000 Gs. Reaching the acceleration required for launch is itself a difficult engineering problem. Here we go. At those speeds, friction just from the air would be intense. So the inside of the accelerator is actually a giant vacuum chamber. If you can pull all of the air out of it, then there's no more air resistance and consequently heat on the rotational structure. There we go. Now we're going to go let the, the vacuum chamber draw down the pressure, and then we can spin up. Accelerating system. Nine thousand, not one point one. Ten thousand. Ten thousand G's coming down. Yeah. <laughs> Go. Well, look at that. I don't hear any rattles. Looks like it's intact. The pressure one feels when you're hoping for success is mostly about the incredible personal human investment that's gone in. 
and not wanting to let down all of your colleagues when the moment of truth comes. Let's crack it open. I'm going to test voltage on the solar cell. Yeah, so 0 0.8, that's in a reasonable range. Okay, so now we will take out the computer. Looks like it is intact. It's still responding when we send it messages, so it looks pretty good. I would say that that was a successful test. Pretty cool. Woo! <laughs> Spin Launch has done what engineers do. Methodically design, test, evaluate, and repeat as they step their way up to a system big enough to send payloads into low Earth orbit. We went to the desert of New Mexico to build a flight test system, you know, at a large scale that would allow us to essentially prove that we had not only the technology validated, we could test our own ability to construct and to execute on a system of this magnitude and scale. Launching at one-third scale was a powerful milestone, spinning the payload to more than 1,000 miles per hour. It was an emotional moment for the team. You, you have to have a little bit of faith to bring something like this to that level and to that, that scale. We've conducted 10 successful back-to-back -back flight tests. We haven't had a single failure. And I think that's a testament to the practicality of the technology. This will be for the first time since we've gone to space as a species that we'll be doing it differently. It's common for engineers to build on an old technology, transforming it with new materials to scale their way to innovation. It's with a spinning arm that's throwing satellites into space. That's totally new. How could that not be exciting? 